I'm Carol Bailey. I teach sociology. And the filmmaker is uh, Mark Gaynor. And our, we're going to turn over to our interviewee. Uh, Marty, if you would give us your name and uh, the date. Let me just add one thing. It's being done in D310 on April 4th, 1995. Okay, so you your name your position? DT310, of course, is a terribly undersized faculty office, which by the year 2050 will be much larger or disappear totally. Uh, I'm Marty Zelnick. I am a professor of interior design of uh, at FIT, and I'm also chairperson of the faculty association with about six weeks left in my term. Actually, through the summer, but through the school term. And I've been at FIT for completing my 26th year now. Uh, and what position did you start in? Uh, I'm one of the rare faculty who probably started here as a full-time instructor in interior designers. I was never an adjunct faculty member at all. And in those days, they actually fought and hired people full-time. Um, could you talk a little about the years at FIT and what changes you've seen? In well, probably, I've seen a lot of changes, and I've been involved in a lot of the changes. Probably the most dramatic change, of course, has been the change in character of the school, going from a relatively limited two-year community college to that of a, a, a baccalaureate program, and then eventually having a graduate program. Of course, we're at the very early stages of both the graduate program and the baccalaureate program, and I would guess that in the next decade or two, those are going to eventually be extremely critical to FIT's uh, value and survival, those programs. Uh, what were the students like 26 years ago? I would say that the, the biggest change in the students is, is that they were the more traditional student coming out of high school. They, they Demographically, they were younger. I would say we had a larger percentage of students who were uh, just out of high school, your 18-year-olds, your 19-year-olds, maybe some who had taken a year off or so and a smaller percentage of the, the student making a career change or the, the older adult or the, even the middle-aged adult. Today, the students uh, tend to be better educated, at least in terms of liberal arts education, uh, older, uh, have degrees. It's, in a sense, they're viewing their two-year degree in interior design, in many cases, as, as graduate school although they're only getting AAS degrees, but it's really graduate school or change in career educations. But I think that's the fundamental change. Uh, you're still getting students who are first-generation college students, probably many, many more foreign language students here, particularly Asian students at this point, than there were uh, uh, 25 years ago. And, and what about males and females? Is there, uh, yeah, I, I think in those days we used to fight over who would get the one male student, and there was a very small percentage of males. And today, while it's still predominantly female, I, if, if I were to guess at least in interior design, we probably have about uh, a quarter of the students are now male, uh, three quarters are female. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty uh, hefty change, because it used to be maybe two or three percent would be male students back in the early 70s. So that's changed quite a bit in interior design. I don't know whether it's changed that way in the rest of the college, but... What about the placements of the students? Have you noticed, uh, what were their placements like years ago when they graduated and today? I, I think pretty much the same. I think what has happened is that uh, the interior design department in particular has really, its reputation has gone up dramatically in the last uh, 25 years. I think one of the reasons for that, of course, is the baccalaureate program. And in a sense, we have also been able to overcome the handicap of being known as a fashion school. E even today, most people who are in the industry still don't know that FIT might be producing interior design students. But more of the professionals and the professional organizations know today that we have an interior design program than they did 25 years ago. I think 25 years ago, there were a couple of us who were on a mission to put the interior design department on the map. Uh, in terms of the professional organizations and practitioners, and we've been pretty successful in, in doing that. And what is your background in terms of being uh, your work in the industry in terms of... Industry? Well, first of all, educationally, my background is four years of fine arts at Brandeis University and then graduate school at uh, getting an MR at Columbia. Uh, Could you explain that degree? Master of Architecture. We, we call it MR. It's easier to say. 
sounds less pretentious. Uh, so eight years of college, I should have been a lawyer or a doctor, and I'm still wondering, but notwithstanding that, uh, my, my experience in the field is that I was born with a T-square in my mouth. My father was an architect, so I was brought up in, I guess, knowing that either I was going to become a professional athlete or an architect, and I guess architecture won out. And so while I went to undergraduate school as a fine arts major, I always knew I was going to study architecture, but I thought it would be better to have the undergraduate education first. Professionally, I have worked uh, with my father. I've worked with, uh, most of my life, I've worked with one of my colleagues on the faculty, Julie Pinero, and we've uh, had a partnership for the last 20 years, and uh, maybe even more. And uh, basically, we've done architecture, interior design. Uh, we've had lean days and not so lean days, but it's been a very general practice with an emphasis on interiors. Uh, and the other, the interior design, what is the linkages with industry, the profession, the department? Well, the, the, the linkages are, are multifaceted in, 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 in that almost everybody who's on the faculty who teaches design is a practitioner. Uh, they either have their own office or they've been working with uh, within industry and in, in firms over the years. Uh, so we all have contacts in various design organizations with professional offices, with architectural firms, design firms, uh, decorating companies, furniture manufacturers. And so there's a very close link and, and it's important to have that link because we've really been able to do a very good job in terms of, of placing students in industry that way. In terms of shaping, you hear in some of the oral histories how the industry has shaped the department. Do you see that? Or I, I think it's worked both ways. I, I think it's, uh, you know, on one hand, industry shapes departments and shapes curriculum and, and influences curriculum. On, on the other hand, I think in many cases, uh, not just FIT, but I think education has in some areas been ahead of industry in terms of where trends are going. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example in terms of computer graphics where I think uh, interior design was much further ahead than most other uh, firms uh, in terms of introducing students' work on the microcomputer for drafting. Uh, not that we influence industry, but we certainly were better anticipators. I remember we had a student who did a thesis on using the, and th in those days I think it was called the Apple, uh, or the black, she had a black apple or whatever, and uh, that was the very first generation of computers. And she did a thesis project uh, using the computer to produce two and three dimensional drawings. And it was very crude and very slow and doesn't compare to, you know, what we have sitting on, on this desk at this point. But uh, when she went out to interview industry to say, you know, what is the need of industry? They kind of looked at her like, well, we're never going to give up T-squares or triangles and so on. And, uh, and even today, there, there's a resistance in terms of uh, whether one should always be designing and drafting using T-squares and triangles. And there's this whole technophobic attitude that many practitioners have. And yet, I'm sure if anybody ever looked at this tape in 20 years from now, they'll say, what's a T-square? What's a parallel ruler? <laughs> All design is, is with, you know, with your fingertip or maybe you're breathing or something like that, and, and you're designing. But uh, right now, there, even now, there's resistance. Uh, can we go back to a theme you touched upon, the nature of the students? Do you see uh, a shift in, you mentioned first generation are still coming to FIT, mm -hmm. first generation college. Sure. But it sounds like you're saying there's more people coming with a BA in... Oh, even a BA or even uh, advanced professional degrees or master's degrees. I mean, it, it's not unusual. Well, what's also very interesting, I'm not sure it's a trend, but uh, I have a student in my class who actually, I went to prep school in the city, you know, private school. Uh, and it's very rare that you see preppies going to SUNY schools in general, let alone FIT in Manhattan. And I have a student who went to the same school I did, and, uh, you know, what are you doing here? She said, well, I went to Michigan for four years, and I was going to get a master's and something, and my parents wanted me to go to law school, and I want to learn to do interior design, but nobody's encouraging me to do that because it's, quote, not professional. So, so what's happening, though, is that even interior design, which used to be viewed as interior decorating or so on, is becoming recognized as a profession comparable to architecture and law. And people are recognizing that and now saying, oh, yes, you can become a professional interior designer. So I think we're starting to get better educated students. 
on one hand, you know, we're students with degrees, students who have uh, who are changing careers, and at the same time, we're still getting a percentage of students, albeit I think a smaller percentage of students, who are coming directly out of high school. Well, that family's following tradition like yourself in interior design. Uh, I haven't seen too much of that. I, I uh, on occasion, will see a, a, a son or a daughter coming in because, they're, in fact, their parent may have even graduated. We've had a couple of situations where the parent graduated possibly in the 60s and their child is now going to uh, study interior design and they'll come to FIT. Uh, that's just in terms of FIT graduates. I think we'll also see people who are in the field. We'll get a lot of architects, for example, whose the, the daughters become interior designers. They still have that stigma of, you know, well, daughters become interior designers and the men become architects. And that's changing as well. And where are the placements? How many students do you have and what's the placement like? Uh, well, it depends on whose statistics you want to buy into or not. Uh, first of all, I think a large percentage of placements uh, are by the students themselves uh, or with the help of faculty. The, the faculty are able to place the students quite a bit. The placement office here is uh, fairly useless in terms of uh, promoting our students. Shouldn't have said that, right? But <laughs> you can edit the tape. But the, 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 this is uh, w w one of the problems is, is that there's very little job development that goes on through the, the placement office. So job development really happens, uh, you know, through faculty advisement and faculty knowing of leads and getting direct phone calls and, and telling students, you know, giving students strategies of how to interview and what to put in portfolio and so on. But most of it's uh, self-generated or, or through the faculty, unfortunately. Do you have internships? Uh, we don't have internships right now. Uh, we are in the process of revising our curriculum and trying to add internships to it. Uh, we just submitted to curriculum committee and got beat up badly because I think we ended up with a four-year program of 150 credits, uh, which, you know, w with justification is probably a little bit on the high side. I, I would foresee probably in uh, the next 10 or 15 years, we may be looking at a five-year baccalaureate program in interior design and uh, or a three-year program in uh, in the AAS. I mean, I think, you know, the whole nature of what an AAS degree and what a BFA degree or a BA degree is has got to be looked at seriously and will probably change dramatically in the next 10 years or so. Why? Well, I, I think what what's happening, at least in interior design, is that the, the tremendous responsibility and, and uh, need for technical information has put great strains on the department to try and fit everything within, you know, the prescribed hours of a of a four year program. Uh, there are schools even now, even as we speak, that are five year programs who are considered to be pretty good programs, but. You know, between technology, between the uh, courses that you need to get in, between the hours that students take just to, to com complete projects, uh, the, the, the need for many of our students to work, which tends to prolong the, uh, the curriculum. I think all of these are, uh, are, are justification for seriously looking at a, a five-year degree down the road. Do you see more students working outside of school than you did 27 years? Years ago. Uh, I think I think I do. Uh, I think students here have always worked a lot. Uh, you know, the problem is around here, nature abhors a vacuum, and if you work out a schedule for students that they can work 10 or 15 hours a week, they'll end up working practically full-time jobs. And the more time you give them, they'll tend to, yes, they'll use it for schoolwork, but they're also going to be finding jobs, you know, either in industry or just to be able to pay for themselves. Are, there's a great burden on our students at this point to, to pay for their education, uh, I think, unlike other types of schools. Similar to most, uh, I think, of the urban SUNY or CUNY schools where the students have to do that. Uh, could we shift a little over to the Faculty Association? Sure. From you wearing that hat? Let me what see, change? where's my hat? <laughs> what changes you've seen in the school? The Faculty Association is a, is a very unusual animal here. You know, we're, we're supposedly part of a, a tripart system uh, where you have administration, union, and uh, the Faculty Association dictating, not dictating, but de helping to develop policy. And I think realistically the Faculty Association over the years has been relatively weak in terms of influencing policy, uh, academic po even academic policy. 
I, I think there has not been a, a sh really sharing of responsibility. It's really been the union and uh, administration being the primary movers, and on occasion the faculty gets called in. I've tried to, I don't know how successfully, but in my two years of office, you know, I've, I've tried to have more of a presence for the faculty association. And I think to a certain extent I've improved it, but I think one has to work very hard at it around here. You know, as uh, Rodney Dangerfield says, the faculty association generally doesn't get that much respect, both from the union and the, uh, and the administration, however. So that, that has to change. Uh, the faculty, you know, it, it may sound cliche, but th they still are the driving forces of the school. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very important that they, they speak up and, and be proactive. Um, and other changes you've seen in the school, anything that you'd like to include, since this is a historical overview to some extent? Changes I've seen in the school. Are events in the past that you think should become part of the archives? Well, I, I think, you know, again, going back to what I said earlier, I think probably the, the most important change of the school was, was the adding of the two years in the baccalaureate program. And that occurred in, what, 1976 or 77 was the first entering baccalaureate class. So it's relatively new, and it isn't even 20 years. I, I think the school needs to really figure out what it wants to be. I think we're, we're in a stage right now that administratively and philosophically, you know, the school is, is very weird, very unusual in terms of what it wants to be and who it wants to serve and, and where it's going. I, I don't think the school has really debated this issue seriously enough and, and has figured out what it wants to be. Obviously, we were initially founded as a two-year community college. Uh, even in adding the baccalaureate degree, we stayed as a two plus two program. I think that that was not thought out as well as it could be, and I think it needs to be thought out even more. I, I think we have to uh, look at the graduate program even more seriously and, and make sure that it, it not only survives, but it, it flourishes. I think the graduate program is going to be very, very important in terms of establishing the future character of the school. I think the school has uh, certain responsibilities that it hasn't uh, fulfilled, not only in terms of education, but in terms of both moral and ethical responsibilities that it has to uh, deal with. I'll, I'll give you a few examples. I think to a certain extent, because we are so industry and professionally driven, uh, we, we are very sensitive to offending industry or taking positions. Uh, yet at the same time, this school, I think, has a moral and ethical responsibility to be much more consumer-driven, if you will. Uh, a case in point might be toy design, where our students today are designing the same monster toys that you're going to find on the commercial market. So on one hand, the rationale for designing the kind of toys and games we, we have is that, well, that's what industry wants. On the other hand, uh, to the extent that our toy department might be looking more at uh, safety of toy products or, or, or coming up with different types of toys that are more educational and less monster, robotic, uh, laser gun driven, uh, I think we're afraid to do that because we're afraid to offend industry. And I think you can look at almost every, every major here and we're missing the ethical component in terms of educating uh, the consumer and educating the uh, the students. Uh, I think there are examples of, of colleges that have newsletters, wellness letters, Harvard, Berkeley, and so on. FIT, for example, should be having a paper that deals with uh, product safety, fabric safety, toy safety, you know, areas that we are strong on, our faculty and students should be doing research in that area. I, I think another area that the school has to get more involved in, and again, here's a major contradiction in that we're not a research institute. I think we, we need to get more involved in research, and I'm not talking about the kind of academic research where people just give papers and, 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 and write uh, little articles for purposes of promotion, but I think research into products and industry and uh, consumer affairs and things of that nature uh, is, is really something that we haven't gotten into as a college and we need to. And of course, there's always the conflict of uh, of hurting a Calvin Klein or offending or Versace or 
or a Mattel industry, and, and therefore they're not going to give us uh, $100,000, which they tend not to do anyway, but that's something else. Okay. Anything else that you'd like to address? Uh, let me see. I think we, we need to have a Division One basketball program at FIT. <laughs> uh, now, other, other than that, maybe we will by then. That was one of my suggestions recently, actually, I made to the, the president. And after they stopped rolling hysterically on the floor, there was some uh, little twinkle in their eye. Maybe that's not such a bad idea. Home court advantage at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, still not a bad idea. No, I, I think that's my crystal ball for the time being. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure.